Well, welcome to Aspen Chapel's podcast for Sunday, March the 6th. And today's one of our service Sundays. Um, what we do a couple of times a year is invite a number of nonprofits to come in and uh, enable them to present uh, to the congregation. It's an opportunity for people to contribute by their work, uh, by going around and doing things for these nonprofits rather than necessarily giving money. Uh, there's a bit of an introduction from me, and then you'll hear from four nonprofits after that. Thank you. We come here on Sundays and part of us just wants to let go and leave behind all the things that are in our lives and going on, but we bring them into this room and we just have a time now just to acknowledge what's going on with our lives, maybe with our eyes closed. Just remembering the struggles that we all have. All of us struggling with something. Working out what to do, and what not to do. And we just acknowledge those things that are frightening us at the moment. Distracting us. knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. We give those concerns and worries up. And we rest in the grace of God. Opening our hearts to receive that grace. often bearing a knowledge of what to do, how to be. We let go of those things that we're attached to, any resentments that we have, any attachments, and we rest in that presence. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ. Well, it might seem that with people coming to talk to us, you might think to yourself, well, what about my service? What about my message that I'm not getting today? I'm coming here and not leaving with the normal, whatever it is I'm filling myself up with. But I, I always remember, I've written it down so I get the words right here, that, that time when Jesus first came into the temple after he'd sort of come out, so to speak. Well, you know what I mean. He came out and, and he walked into the temple on the Sunday and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to, to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I think too often in our lives, we're, we're always focused on ourselves, what we can get out of our spiritual lives, how we can, you know, become more wonderful in ourselves and have a more satisfying life and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes we just got to look out and think, well, actually, the end point of the spiritual life is actually service. You know, when you go through all the enlightenment and all those bits and bobs, everything else, the bad news is that when you get right to the end of it all, there's a door that says, here ye serve. And if you don't go through that door, then you're not at the, the end point of it. You have to go all the way again until you get to the here ye serve door. And it is beholden upon us to serve. And quite often, you know, we, do, we will write a check. 
we will do something. And I know lots of people here, as I look around, I know a lot of people are doing a lot of things in a lot of areas. But it seems to me right that we have a chance just to hear what service is being done and what opportunities there are available, which is why we've invited people here today. So I thought we'd have one of our own up first of all. So Jules Lampton is going to come up. And Jules, I, I, do you want to come up here? I saw Jules actually, Patricia Hill, who's not here with us today. I went to the Shining Stars dinner uh, I, last year, and it was such an amazing organization that at the Outreach Committee, we really wanted them to be represented here. And Jules is going to tell a little bit about what that organization is and how you can participate in it. Thank, Thank you. you, Jules. I'm going to just place this here. Hi, everybody. Um, three years ago, my life changed absolutely forever. Um, I have been volunteering with disabled vets. I'm also part of a rock and roll cancer charity, and we've been around the world raising money for third world cancer centers and doing bone marrow drives. And someone suggested that I might like helping with the shining stars. And I'm like, are those the kids with cancer? And they're like, yeah, those are the kids with cancer. And I said, well, what does that involve? I'm pretty busy. And they said, well, why don't you just come to a meeting and um, we'll let you know what's going on. So I said, okay. And they said, I think you'd like being a buddy to these kids. And I'm like, well, what does that involve? And they said, well, basically, you know, you'll show up, you'll help them to breakfast, you'll help get them in ski clothes, you'll come to an activity or so, there'll be someone helping you, it's not going to be that time consuming. And I'm like, well, sure, sure, I'll, I'll add that in. So anyway, I show up at the end at Aspen. We have a big sign. and We've been assigned four little boys. I'm like, four little boys? Really? Okay. And um, my friend Vivian and I were doing it together. And again, I thought I was going to allot a very small period of time to this. And four nine-year-old boys got off the bus, and life as I knew it has changed forever. And that was Will, Troy, Addison, and Dallin. And what evolved from that was absolutely amazing and incredible. They were bright-eyed and beautiful and I went to the wheeler and my boss said, do you need the week off? I said, I think I need the week off. So I was with these little guys 24 seven and the relationships that formed between the four children, the relationships that formed between myself and the children, the doctors and the nurses that came in. We had ski instructors come all the way from Alaska to help and support these kids. And it was just over the top, the most incredible experience of my life, exhausting, but wonderful. And uh, at the end of the week, we all cried when we said goodbye, but I wasn't really sad because I knew I'd see them all again. And um, two months later, I got a phone call from Dallin's mother. And she said, you know, I just need to let you know that his brain tumors have come back. And um, we don't know. And I'm like, he's nine years old. I mean, I, I thought there was a possibility at some point that we might lose one of these kids. Maybe they'd be a teenager. Maybe they'd be a young adult. But in no way had I conceptualized that I could lose one of these kids. And a few weeks later, she called me and she said, we've lost Alan. And she said, will you please tell the boys? And that was one of the hardest calls I ever had to make were to my three. And to say, you know, boys, you know, Dallin was really sick and he was, he was really sick when he was here and he has brain cancer and, and we've lost Alan. And the hard part, you know, the boys lost their peer, they lost their roommate. But the scary part was, is they also had cancer and their nine-year-old friend had gone. And, um, People say to me all the time, I could never do that. You know, I love kids too much. I'm too sensitive and I, I don't want to be involved with that. And our own beautiful Patricia Hill said to me, she said, you know, people don't understand that these children are angels and they're our messengers. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. This is true. And there's no way I wouldn't be with these kids. It's a highlight of my life. And those of you who know me, I have an amazing life. I do everything. <laughs> but these little boys are the highlights of my life. And Luckily for me, the three that I have um, are in Broom, two are in Broomfield and one are in Littleton. And just to share with you, you know, what these kids go through. This is my little Addison, Klein Hands, and this was his diagnosis when he came to the Shining Stars three years ago. My name is Addison. I am nine. Since I was diagnosed with cancer at age five on April 6, 2010, I've had chemo for 1,168 days. I've lost my hair two times. I've had 118 needle pokes. I've had 74 visits to Children's Hospital, Colorado. I've had four birthday celebrations on the cancer floor. I've had six blood transfusions. I've had three bone marrow aspirations and 20 spinal taps. Today, June 19th, 2013, is my first day off of treatment, and I'm a survivor. Um, Addison, I'm happy to tell you all today, after four years of this, is cancer-free. Because the kids live so close to me and have great friends in Broomfield and Denver, I'm able to be with the boys all the time. And he asked me to come up. He was being awarded by President Obama a service award because his child has given over 100 speeches on pediatric cancer to kids with cancer or kids in school. And 
he is in major service and um, amazing little guy, just my little prince and my champion. So I was there for that. And he continues. He was actually coincidentally enough giving a speech with Love, Hope, Strength, the Rock and Roll Cancer Charity that I'm with last night. Um, those of you who know me well, pretty much recognize probably a little Traveling Troy. <laughs> um, Traveling Troy was a major baseball player. He was a ski racer. He was diagnosed with neuroblastoma at seven years old. He came to the camp, just fell in love with him, head over heels, just this little sprite, this little bad boy. Um, he got me out of, he was my metanoia. I'd been injured. I was scared to ski. I couldn't ski for two years, couldn't teach skiing, couldn't run, couldn't do any things I wanted to. I was scared to ski again. He goes, Jules, Jules, will you go in the terrain park with me? I went, absolutely, let's go. So I was going off jumps and rails and everything with him. So these kids brought me back to life. They were my messengers and my heroes. And this little guy um, also hiked with me and my beloved Mike Peters, who um, Nicholas and Heather got to meet. And Mike is a cancer survivor who has relapsed for the third time, but is relentless and his pursuit of finding a cure for cancer. And my little boys got to meet his little boys. We hiked Bell Mountain two years ago. Shortly after we hiked, little Troy relapsed. Um, very frightening for us all. He was told he was going to have to have a bone marrow transplant. Um, but before he had his bone marrow transplant, he wanted to play one more baseball game. And he goes, Jules, Jules, can you come? And I said, absolutely, I'll come. So I go to Littleton. My little guy's got a port in his chest. He throws out a double play. He slides into home. Next day, he goes into hospital. Has a bone marrow transplant. Not only does the child have a bone marrow transplant, since it was his second relapse, they decided that it would be a good idea to try experimental immunotherapy. So this 10-year-old is in hospital and um, 10 hours a day for one week out of every month for the next five months after a bone marrow transplant and isolation, this child um, makes it through and his, his beautiful mother and friends at work decided to create Traveling Troy. So when he was in isolation and in treatment all these times that he would be able to see the world. So luckily I get to travel and go and do and Traveling Troy went to Broadway with me. My girlfriend who works for Saturday Night Live said, it's not fair that he gets to go to Broadway. He needs to go to SNL. So Traveling Troy and I met the whole cast of SNL. We did a photo shoot. Parent, uh, pictures were sent to his parents for Christmas. So this is my little guy. These are my children. And um, I luckily am going skiing with Will. I've been invited for his spring break in two weeks at Keystone. So, you know, these kids, people say, you know, God, I can't believe you do this. And I'm like, they're not only the most remarkable children I've ever known, they're probably the most remarkable human beings I've ever known. So the kids are the gift to me. And a little bit about the foundation. It started in 2001 where a group of volunteers decided there needed to be in a way to provide emotional support for kids with cancer and to do it through some sort of outdoor activity. So what started out as adaptive skiing in Winter Park nine years ago was turned into 50 programs, five major events, and our um, event is actually starting this Friday where upon I'll receive four more little boys <laughs> that I'm sure I'll love to the moon and back, and it's awesome. And uh, some of the activities that these kids get to do next week People say, why do you do this? Well, I get to do this because I get to be involved in ski instruction. We have a mountain rescue with avalanche demo dogs. It's so cool where the kids are buried and the dogs dig them out. Um, we go snowmobiling at the T-Lazy 7. We have an ice cream star bar. Uh, we have a winter game race day. We have a disco party at the Elks. Best party in town, and I go to most of them. Uh, we have the Imagination Station. We have the Ultimate Taxi. A friend of mine last year said, Let's bring a police car so you can imagine the kids with a policeman and getting to ride around in a police car. Amazing. Talent show, what Nicholas referenced earlier. We have a um, big celebration banquet at the St. Regis, as posh as any event in Aspen. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely magnificent. Um, and then we have our summer games and more fun to be had where we rock climb, we raft, cooking classes at the Nell, pretty posh again, fishing, horseback riding. The majority of our children are between the ages of 8 and 18 with a special focus on children living with a mental or physical disability as a result of treatment or disease. And every three minutes, there's a child in the world that's diagnosed with cancer in our own country. 43 children a day are diagnosed with cancer. And two out of the three that do survive the pediatric cancer are faced with chronic health conditions that affect them for the rest of their lives. So uh, the impact on the family is also unbelievable. So the emotion of knowing that you're seven or eight year old has cancer and may possibly lose their life to it. There's a the financial implication of being a parent to a child with cancer. So these kids, you know, the expense and the cost of 
of what that is to take care of a child with cancer. 80% of our families result poverty. They result in um, bankruptcy. Some of the parents divorce. Most times, one of the parents has to quit their job or their career to help um, take the kid to the hospital or be in the hospital with the child. So um, as Nicholas said, you know, you can be in service. You can be in service through your time. You can donate time. You can be involved with these activities. I still say you can write a check. Um, helpful also, as you see, for the families. But many, many ways to help. And uh, we, I played in a golf tournament in Denver, so you can have fun doing it. If you want to go run a half marathon in Winter Park, you can do that. If, you, if all of that's a little too adventurous for you, we created an amazing event here last year called Wine, Women, and Shoes. Very Sarah Jessica Parkish, Parker-ish. Um, very glam, very wonderful. You can create your own event. Um, you can see me downstairs afterwards. And these kids basically are told their whole life, you can't go play. You can't play sports. You can't go to school. We want to say, yes, you can. You can be an athlete. You can be a musician. You can do anything you want. So if you want to help me remind these kids that they can come and play for a day, a week, or a year and forget that they have cancer for that period of time, I'd appreciate it. I'll be downstairs afterwards to answer any questions. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I know there are members of our, our community who are also part of that. Uh, Carolyn's part of that, aren't you? Yes. You put your hands up if you're, you're, you're volunteering for that as well. Yeah, and so do talk to these people if you want to afterwards, because there are members of the congregation uh, doing that already. Good. Another organization we're going to invite now, uh, bring David up, the Buddy Program, which is uh, very much part of Aspen Chapel in the past. And uh, David, he's going to talk to us a bit about that. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having us here this morning. This is really quite an opportunity, and it's uh, great to see so many smiling faces that I recognize out there as well. Uh, as I've been in Aspen with the Buddy Program for just about four years now, four, it'll be four years next week, actually, moved here from Chicago. And as Greg, uh, sorry, as, as Nicholas mentioned, there are many connections uh, between the Buddy Program and the Aspen Chapel, the primary one being Greg Anderson, who founded the Buddy Program in 1973, and of course served here for many, many years until recently. Uh, Catherine Ann Provine, who also you know, works and serves here, uh, was the executive director before me at the Buddy Program for seven years before I took over. And um, I'm sure none of you knows this, but it's, it's, I uh, rent a, a duplex in Mountain Valley and sitting outside of my door is a bench that was made from one of the main beams of this chapel when it was being built because my neighbor, Charlie Hopton, worked on the construction of this building and he's got this beam and had it made into a bench. And so it's sitting outside my apartment, which is pretty interesting. Uh, the Buddy Program has been around since 1973. We served nearly 1,000 youth last year. We are the second largest mentoring organization in the state of Colorado. And between Aspen and Carbondale, which is our current service area, one in 10 youth is in our programs. So we impact a lot of kids through our programs, through four different mentoring programs. We have um, some high school kids, actually quite a few high school kids, 250 high school kids up and down the valley that work with 250 elementary and middle school kids. And then we have adults that work with young kids as well. And that's our community program, which is what we want to interest you in today, which is helping to change the, the, life of a, the life of a child, the life of that child's family, and perhaps your own life. Um, so what we do is we, we find caring adults and we match them up with kids who need another adult in their life. And this isn't, as I say, it's not an, an authoritative figure or role. It's not someone who's a teacher or a parent who's telling these kids what to do. It's a role model. It's someone who role models appropriate behavior for these kids, guides them, encourages them, and as much as anything, shows up on a consistent basis. If you look at our little buddies up and down the valley, they're about 60% um, girls, about 40% boys. They're about 45% Latino, 45% Caucasian, 5 or 10% other. Uh, currently, about half of them are in Aspen, about half are in Basalt, and then there's another maybe 10% in Carbondale. I know that's more than 100%, but uh, bear with me. Um, we, we just op we've been growing. We just opened an office in Carbondale last summer so that we can serve the Carbondale community better. We know that because of the size of Carbondale and the demographics of Carbondale, there are more kids there that need our help than there are in Aspen and Basalt combined which means there are probably a thousand kids in Carbondale that we're not serving yet that we need to serve. And the thing that limits our growth and our ability to get after these kids is um, in part, you know, money to hire staff, but it's largely volunteers. And so we're looking for volunteers who want to help 
change the life of a child by basically being there for them, meeting with them three to four times a month. We ask for a minimum one-year commitment. Our average buddy pair stays together for four years. The national average for big brothers, big sisters is less than two. So we've got a pretty good track record. And of course, our goal is to have you stay together with this child through high school graduation. And the stories that come out of the program, the lives that are changed are really quite remarkable. And in a lot of cases, um, you know, there are some more difficult situations where maybe the child has gone through some trauma or some stress or some abuse that we, that we help them work through. And we have uh, a staff of case managers who work on those cases, who, who help work with the families and the, and the youth to get them the help they need. We will arrange and pay for counseling for the child if that's what's required. And we'll even arrange and pay for counseling for the parents if they're not getting along, because we really want to try to help the entire family that we're working with and not just that one child. Uh, you will often see not just the child, but their siblings also have big brothers and be in one of our programs. How many people here are big, are big buddies? We've got a handful or have been big buddies, um, even more. So there's a lot of people that have been involved in this program over the years, and you know the impact that you can have. Um, a lot, most of these kids don't have significant um, problems, as you might think about it. They're just normal kids, but they have a single parent, perhaps. 40% of our families come from single parent families, whereas the average in this area is 24%. Uh, more than 70% of our families are earning less than $50,000 a year, which in this valley means that you're on some sort of assistance. A lot of the students are on lunch assistance or the families are getting assistance. Um, and a lot of these kids, they have, even if they have two parents, both the parents are working in a lot of cases, working multiple jobs, or they're living down Valley and Carbondale are commuting to Aspen's. They're spending a lot of time out of the house. And we'll have a situation where you've got an eighth grader who's the oldest child, maybe the oldest of three or four children, and they get home from school and they have to help take care of their families. And so they get put into an adult role you know, pretty early. And having an, an adult there to help guide them and take them out of those responsibilities and just let them be a kid again, you know, where they're not the supervisor and the more senior person, but they're, they're the little buddy with an adult friend of theirs who can get together and, and get the encouragement. And you know, again, just having that reassurance, that there's someone there who's helping them, guide them, providing advice, who's not going to judge them. And so they can ask the questions maybe they don't want to ask their parents because they're afraid of what, how their parents might react to the question. Um, so we're really changing lives and we make this easy for you. We have case managers, every family and big buddy and little buddy is assigned a case manager and they work through the logistics so that if there are issues with the family not showing up or, um, or boundary issues between you and the, and the family, the case manager will help work through those so you don't have to have those difficult conversations with the mother about, look, I'm not a babysitter. I can't come over Friday night at the, at the drop of a hat. Um, we provide over 20 free activities every year. So at least once a month, there's a free activity for you and your little buddy to do together. Everything from rock climbing to fly fishing, to cooking, to arts projects, to hikes, all kinds of fun stuff to do together. We provide discounts at over 40 businesses up and down the valley. So when you and your little buddy are together, you can go do fun things. And I think the most important thing is we do a really great job of matching you with someone who shares your interests. One of the most common things I hear from new big buddies when they come back is, it's amazing how much I have in common with this child. We just like to do all the same things. And that's not an accident. We do that intentionally, obviously, so that you like doing the same things. You don't need to find something to do with the child. You just need to do what you normally like to do and once a week include a child in what you're doing. And that, just that little bit of time can really have a big impact on a child and change their lives. So... Uh, Laura Crow, who's our recruitment director, is here with me today, and we need to recruit 50 new big buddies every year to just to try to keep up. And as it is, we have 38 kids on our wait list. So we always need new big buddies. It's easier than you think. It's a lot of fun, and it's really rewarding, and I would encourage you to get involved. Thank you. We're just going to take a few moments just to say some prayers and just to be with um, what's going on at the moment.
We just pray for all these organizations here. We will encourage and bless those involved. Pray that you open our hearts to be able to participate. Pray for all the people that they're involved with, the children in these first two organizations and all those who they're touching at the moment. Pray for the care that's going on in our valley at the moment. That more people will be open to serving, to enabling this to be a better place to live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Also pray for all those that we know are struggling in our own community. Those that are close to our hearts. Those who are ill. Suffering, bereaved. In prison. Homeless. We pray for compassion in ourselves. To be able to reach out. Pray for compassion in others to contain what's going on. And pray for our town and our state and our country, that you will come and bring peace into the hearts of our leaders and bring peace into the heart of our country. Amen. Good, our third organization is English in Action. I'm going to invite uh, Viviana Gonzalez to come and talk a bit about that. Here you are, Viviana. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Viviana Gonzalez. I'm the program coordinator for English in Action. Um, English in Action was created in the Basalt Library about 20 years ago. Actually, our 20 year anniversary was last year. And uh, what we do is we help all kinds of immigrants in the valley to, uh, we tutor them. Uh, English with volunteer tutors. Last year, we served over 240 students uh, with over 160 volunteers. And what we do, our volunteers meet once a week uh, for one hour, and they tutor English. The only requirement is for you to speak English. Uh, you don't need to speak Spanish. You don't need to. Most of our students are Spanish speakers, but you don't need to speak a second language to do that. And you can do it in all different um, kind of ways. Uh, some of our tutors do love to uh, sit down and have a book and teach and teach, uh, like um, follow a lesson. But some others just want to sit down and have a conversation. And for that, that's why we have students with all kinds of levels of English. Some of them have no um, very basic um, knowledge of English, but some of them are advanced and they want to practice their conversation or they may be pursuing together it's GED or something like that. And so according to that, then we'll find a tutor that would like to that, do that specific activity. For example, we have tutors that love history and we have a lot of students that want to get their citizenship. And as you know, or I don't know if you know, but for to get the citizenship, you have to learn a hundred history questions. Um, and so you have to learn them by heart and you also have to be able to have a conversation with an immigration um, officer. And so our, um, we have tutors that help with that, but we also have tutors that, for example, we have parents that are not able to communicate with the kids, so they need help with school because they don't know what's going on or they never go to a parent teacher um, conference or anything like that because they don't have the English skills. So that's why it's so important for us to have somebody to um, tutor them. And so a lot of our students never, um, when they work here in the Valley, like a lot of them are for food and beverage or hospitality and where they work, they always speak Spanish. And one of their main thing, for example, if they're Spanish speakers, and then when they go home, because they wanna keep the Spanish with their kids, they still speak Spanish. And they're always like speaking Spanish the whole time. And so when you meet with one, with the tutor, um, you are the only person that they actually sit down and speak in English and they have, they're in a comfort zone, they're not, they don't feel threatened like in a classroom where you don't know if you can speak or not, somebody's gonna mock me or something like that. So, and a lot of, and all of them are adults. Uh, we do not tutor uh, kids and the reason why is because you're allowed to go to school if you're 18 years old, younger. And so um, all of our students are adults they uh, come from all kinds of countries, over 33 different countries, but almost 80% of them are 
uh, from Central America, Mexico, and El Salvador. Uh, we have a couple of tutors here um, in the chapel. I see a couple of them, David and Sandy. <laughs> yes, and oh, how are you? <laughs> Funny. And so I've seen um, all, you can see all this transformation from the students, like where very simple things, like for example, if they're on the bus and they're so excited, they go come to English in action. And they're like, oh, I just had a conversation with somebody in English. And it was very simple conversation, like how was your day at work and something like that. And something simple like going to the person, um, going to the bank and being able to get a bank account, something like that, that we take for granted because we're able to speak English. Um, but they, for them, is such a big step because they don't have their kids talking for them all the time. Um, what we ask for our volunteers is to volunteer once a week for one hour. Uh, that's the minimum, and it's a minimum of six months. And so um, we do a volunteer tutor training, and we'll train you, and we'll give you some of the tools. And um, based on that, we'll talk to each individual tutor, and we find what kind of things you would like to do. If you would like to, as I mentioned before, just have a conversation and tutor somebody, like if you're a teacher or something. And based on that, we'll find a student that will match that and will also match your free schedule. So whenever you have a free, uh, free time, you say, I only can do Tuesdays in the evening, then we'll have somebody that'll match that specific schedule. Um, you don't have, we go all around the valley from Aspen to Carbondale, and we have great relationships with the Pinkie County Library, the Salt Library, and we also have our office in Algeville. A lot of our parents start meeting in the libraries and in the office in Algeville, but then after the relationship starts going on, some people start meeting at their houses or at coffee shops or wherever you feel more comfortable. Um, but a lot of them remain in the library just because we have all of our materials and everything there. We also provide the students with books, if that's what you like to do. And then um, we we'll provide you with also different activities, like for example, we're gonna go snowshoeing next week with students and tutors. We'll go um, to Theater Aspen. Uh, we'll have different picnics and padlocks and all different kinds of activities. Like um, we also went to a talk with the poet laureate from the United States with the Aspen um, Writers Foundation. And so we had a lot of different things that you can do as a tutor and you can do with your student, or you can also come and help us. So um, I'll be downstairs and I'll have all the information for our next volunteer tutor training. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Viviana Gonzalez. Great. And it is amazing to hear what's going on in the Valley, how people are helping each other. And it's so fantastic. Thank you again, all of you, for coming along uh, and, uh, and talking to us. Finally, our last organization, the Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers, David Hamilton. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, very pleasure to be here today. Uh, and now for something really completely different, uh, in, in addition to all these wonderful organizations that have gone before us. Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers was started 21 years ago, really to bring uh, a mission of outdoor stewardship uh, to the valley and uh, to get folks to really take care of our public lands because everything that surrounds us and the reason I think a lot of us are here is because of the beautiful environment and the recreational opportunities that surround us. Uh, it's unfortunate that there really aren't enough, um, isn't enough money in the, in the federal government's budget to take care of our public lands anymore. And every year since we started, 21 years ago, that budget continues to shrink. Um, and we do a lot of things on public land to keep um, them maintained and enhance them and uh, sustainable. Lots of things that you'll hear about if you come volunteer with us. But we really uh, saw the need um, uh, to do more and really bring that message of stewardship um, to the Valley. The lineage of Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers is uh, we really are descendants from the Appalachian Mountain Club on the East Coast, which developed a, a model of uh, engaging volunteers in the out of doors. And in the early 80s, that model was taken around the country and kind of spread like a Johnny Appleseed. We see if we can get this model spread around the country. In the state of Colorado, there was an is an organization called Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado that I got involved with when I moved to Colorado in 1987. Um, and just totally got pulled in and hooked. And um, moved to this valley in uh, 1994 after working here uh, part-time for several years, and we did a project on Mount Sopras uh, with the VOC to uh, 
build the trail above Thomas Lakes to get you up to the ridge line and had really great turnout, really did a lot of great work. And it started to engage a conversation with the Forest Service and some other individuals that were had similar beliefs uh, about getting volunteers out there engaged in public lands. And so we thought about uh, trying to start Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers and uh, picked a couple projects that first year in 1995 and uh, had pretty good success. One of our great first projects was in the Hunter Creek Valley where we actually went in and, and uh, rebuilt a lot of the boardwalk, made some significant improvements on the Hunter Creek Trail. We had 60 volunteers that came out that day and we said, well, I think we actually might have something here. Maybe we've reached that critical mass. So since that time, we've really grown a good bit. Um, say this is our 21st year that we're going into now. We've done hundreds of projects between here and Rifle, which is really our regional community and really what we've tried to focus on. Um, and most of the work that we do is with trail work. And I'm assuming most people, if they've known of Roaring Forgotter Volunteers or volunteered with us, uh, we do public projects, we call them now, up and down the valley. Some of them are half day, full day. We've even done some overnights, week-long projects here and there, and really uh, tried to get folks to come out and spend that one day. So we've really set up to make sure that someone coming in that wants to volunteer with us doesn't necessarily need any skills or, or, or anything coming into it. We have a, a very volunteer-driven organization. Most of our crew leaders, we have a few staff now, but most of our crew leaders are volunteers. Most of the folks who make this organization go are volunteers. And so when someone comes into one of our projects, they're greeted in the morning by volunteers sitting behind a table with coffee and waivers, and, uh, and we get folks assigned. We have tools. We have everything set up the agencies. We have a work plan. And so we form volunteers into crews, and we go out and work, and and get a lot of things done. Um, and we really try to make it a great experience for people. If someone gives their time to us, we want to make sure that they come out and they have a great time, they have the right leadership, they have the tools, they get a lot of work done. And if that really goes well, then they will actually help build a trail or plant a tree or restore a stream bank, um, maintain a trail. And when you walk away from that, we're hoping that you have some new appreciation of what it takes to maintain and to work in the out of doors, and that you also take a piece of ownership in that outdoors. And if that happens, then we've really accomplished our mission of stewardship and got you to really take our land and, and make it yours and to be out there and help. So that's our main model, and that's how we got started. Um, so as we've grown, and we figured there's only so many weekends in a summer, and you can only do so much, we said, well, there, are there other ways that we can get folks out and get them engaged? And so about five years ago, we launched an expansion plan and we started doing some evening projects to get away from, from, uh, from the weekends, which has worked out really well for us. Um, and we've also started a, a group workday program. And we started a youth program called the Young Stewards Initiative. And one of the reasons I think we got invited today is because we've done some work with the church uh, and uh, getting some kids out. And so they saw the opportunity there. I know we're working on something again for this year. So uh, just a real quick uh, on the youth program. Uh, one thing we saw early on in these public projects was groups of kids would come out and, 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 and come out and work, but they didn't necessarily know why they were there. Not, when our adults show up, they've made the time, they've made the call, they've made it happen, they have an idea what they're getting into. But it was really disappointing to me in, in, in thinking that we really want to create a great volunteer experience for everyone, that if a group of kids came out and only 40% of them got it, we weren't really doing that well. So we realized that kids actually get volunteered. And that's a big difference than coming out and doing it on your own. So when we started our youth program, we really said we really need to hire someone that can go out and knows how to work with kids to get them engaged, knows the fun games, knows how to, to you know, get them before they come out knowing what they're going to do, what they're getting into, and then hopefully have that experience. And the uh, program has taken off. Uh, we worked with um, over 1,500 kids uh, last year, to kind of reach the capacity of that level. And we're making a pretty good impact on, on getting kids outside. And of course, I think all of you know, the kids spend less and less time playing outside, more times behind screens. Um, so we really think we're making an impact on creating those future stewards. So that's going on. Uh, and then uh, the main reason why we're here today is to see if this congregation might be interested in uh, doing a group work day with us. So one of our other new programs was if we could get businesses or clubs or organizations to get at least six or eight volunteers together. There's so much work that needs to be done in this valley that it's pretty easy for us to match that group with a place and an activity and to organize it with a land manager and actually go out and do that. So it's really a custom uh, Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteer Project. Last year, we did 24 of those up and down the valley. 
Uh, we did 18 the year before. It's really starting to grow. And um, it's really easy for us to match up uh, a group. Um, part of what we hope when we match up these groups is that they'll really like what they do and actually adopt that trail or adopt that park. And they make a commitment to go long term and, and, and do maintenance and keep it up. Um, and if they do that, then we actually put a sign up for them on the trailhead acknowledging that and, and, and so forth. So, so that's always the, the, the hope. So what we're trying to do with today's activity, and I'll be downstairs later, is we're trying to see if there's enough folks to be willing to do this. We're looking at a possible Thursday evening. We've got a couple of dates picked out. Uh, and if we get that critical, and then we also have two Saturday mornings picked out. So we're looking at evenings, uh, maybe like five to dusk or a Saturday morning. We've got a couple of dates picked out and we'll see what the interest is and see if uh, we can put something together and get, uh, get you guys involved in what we're doing and, and find another group that wants to come out and help. Um, so, uh, and just really quickly, um, and there's many things for volunteers to do. You don't have to be a young and spry. Uh, we also have ambassadors on projects. You can help with that morning table and registering the volunteers and, and helping to schmooze them during the day and keep them refreshed. Uh, we also do uh, dinner at the end of the day. And we also go out and we do a lot of outreach in the community. So lots and lots of things uh, that you can do to get engaged with volunteers uh, and uh, do it with Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers. So thanks again for having me. And I hope to see you all downstairs.